Leslie Wickman, PhD, is an internationally respected research scientist, engineering consultant, author, and inspirational speaker. She was born and raised in the Pacific Northwest. Her interest in space started at the early age when her father would take her and her siblings outside on a clear, starry night to look at the moon, stars, and planets through his telescope. Dr. Wickman holds a master's degree in aeronautical and astronautical engineering and a doctoral program and degree in human factors and biomechanics, both from Stanford University. For more than a decade, Wickman was an engineer for Lockheed Martin Missiles and Space Program, where she worked on NASA's celebrated Hubble Space Telescope and International Space Station programs, receiving commendation from NASA for her contributions and being designated as a Lockheed's corporate astronauts, hence the nickname Rocket Girl. Another noteworthy achievement in her role and WET design is R&D and programming for the Bellagio Fountains in Las Vegas. Dr. Wickman also works as a research scientist on techn technical and policy aspects of national aerospace and defense issues. She has lectured around the world on satellite servicing, spaceflight psychology, physiology, astronaut training and operations, as well as various topics in astronomy, environmental stewardship. Besides her research fields, Wickman is a dedicated athlete, playing competitive beach doubles volleyball with CBVA and FIVB, as well as both indoor and beach volleyball for athletics in action in Bolivia, Brazil, and South Africa. She is now retired from the women's professional tackle football, but not before earning all conference recognition and helping her team, the California Quake, win the Women's World Bowl. She currently acts as a professor of aerospace, industrial, and mechanical engineering at California Baptist University in Riverside, California, and also serving as an executive director of the American Scientific Affiliation. Some of her recent projects include climate change impacts on national security, assessment of future human spaceflight missions, and technologies human factors, problem for extreme environments, fighter pirate proficiency training, sustainable agriculture, and water reclamation. I present before you Dr. Leslie Wickman. Good day, it's nice to be with you. Thank you for the invitation. So I'm going to be talking about living and working in space and my career and the research that I've done. So can we please advance to the next slide? Primarily what I'll be talking about today is the human factors engineering for spaceflight. And human factors engineering is about keeping astronauts healthy, safe, and productive while they're flying in space. As part of my doctoral research at Stanford University, I did research on spacesuit design at NASA Ames Research Center in Northern California. And the photographs that you see on this slide, on the left-hand side, you see an aerial view of NASA Ames Research Center at the south end of the San Francisco Bay. So the water that you see in the top side of that picture is actually the lower part of the San Francisco Bay. The photograph that you see on the lower right is a picture of my, one of my flights aboard the KC-135 research aircraft, which is also known as the Vomit Comet. And I'll talk about that some more later. But uh, people commonly get sick, get motion sickness aboard the Vomit Comet, which is why it's called that. So in the middle of grad school at Stanford, I started working at Lockheed Martin Missiles in Space in Northern California. I worked on both the Hubble Space Telescope Project as well as the International Space Station programs. And I was in charge of astronaut interface uh, engineering as well as astronaut training and uh, making sure that all of the interfaces that the astronauts would have to work with in space were designed appropriately. Before long, I had accumulated so much astronaut training myself along the way that I was designated as Lockheed's corporate astronaut. So I went through literally hundreds of hours of simulations and training exercises in the role that I played at Lockheed. I got my pilot's license, my scuba certification in order to be able to participate in uh, neutral buoyancy activities in gigantic water tanks. I flew, as I mentioned before, on the KC-135 research aircraft. 
And I haven't yet gotten my chance to fly in space, but I was contacted recently um, ask, to ask if I would be interested in a Mars mission, which would be a flyby of Mars, going from Earth, circling around Mars, and coming back. And that would be about a 500-day mission in space. I also spent and still spend a lot of time doing research with federal think tanks uh, working on NASA and Air Force studies, uh, including NASA's crew exploration vehicle, which is to be the replacement for the shuttle uh, and has led to the, you may have heard of the SpaceX Crew Dragon vehicle that is at the space station currently. I also worked on Mars exploration rover projects as well as some lunar and Mars mission planning activities. So some of the specific topics that are important to keeping astronauts safe and healthy and as well as productive in space over the long haul include uh, space physiology. And residence in the weightlessness of space affects the human body in much the same way as extended inactivity here on Earth does. So the unique conditions of spaceflight, such as reduced gravity, higher radiation exposure, the vacuum of space, and the extreme temperature variations uh, lead to various physiological effects in the human body. And these effects manifest themselves through the body as well as the mind, and they range in the time of onset as well as the duration and recovery after uh, return to Earth, anywhere from minutes to months. And some of the most serious effects are cardiovascular deconditioning, bone loss or bone demineralization, and radiation damage. So because of the fact that people are floating around in zero gravity rather than walking in 1G, it's much easier to move around in space. And just sitting in the chairs as you are right now, you are using postural muscles as well as putting mechanical stresses on your bones. Uh, that is not necessary in space. So when we're in space, it's like floating in a water tank with a life vest on. It's very relaxing, very easy, and puts very little physiological demand on your muscles, your heart, and your bones. So as I mentioned, these effects take um, place uh, with limited or uh, different sorts of times of onset. And some of the immediate effects um, that happen within minutes to hours of being in space. They're also very quickly reversible. But the first thing that I'd like to talk about is a height increase. And as I said, without uh, gravity pulling down on your body and um, compressing your spine, your spine decompresses and stretches out. And this can produce a one to two inch increase in your height. And along with that, there's an abdominal girth decrease. Now, people. Many people in the United States would actually find that to be an attractive effect. They'd like to be taller and thinner. <laughs> um, in addition, there's an internal organ shift within the abdominal cavity, and your posture is altered. Now, when I have young students in the audience, I often ask them to stand up with me and practice the neutral, the neutral body posture that astronauts assume in space. But you all look like a very dignified audience, so I won't ask you to participate with me. But I will demonstrate for you. So if you can imagine what it would feel like to have a life jacket on and be in a water tank or a pool, that's essentially how it would look. And so I'm going to, going to attempt to uh, demonstrate that now. So this is the posture that astronauts assume in space. It's kind of your arms float up, your knees bend, and it's just a very relaxed position that you float around the space vehicle in. In addition to that, with the removal of gravity, there's a fluid shift upward in the body. So again, we don't have gravity constantly pulling the bodily fluids down towards our feet. So the blood and other bodily fluids shift upward into the chest and the, the head. And this actually results in a kind of facial puffiness or a sensation of being congested and not being able to breathe very well or smell things very well or hence taste things very well. Now intermediate effects come on within hours to days. And this, uh, 
this headward fluid shift leads to some more serious effects than just this facial puffiness. What happens is as the blood pools in your upper body around your heart, your heart has pressure receptors that are known as baro receptors, B-A-R-O receptors. And they sense an increased blood pressure in the body. Now, your body is very smart and does a lot of things subconsciously that we're not aware of. And one of the things that happens is this increased blood pressure that's sensed around the heart triggers a diuretic response. And so your body then begins to urinate more than usual and limit, eliminate what the body perceives to be excess fluid. So then this leads to a perpetually dehydrated effect of the, on the body for the remainder of your time in space. And astronauts have to attempt to counteract this by drinking lots of fluids while they're in space. So again, this results in an overall reduction in blood volume, um, which can lead to some other effects uh, on the, the body's system that I'll talk about a little bit later. Um, there are also vestibular system effects. We're used to, again, moving around in a constant gravity field. So we have this constant force downward on our body. And the vestibular system includes uh, the inner ear canals as we move around in 1G uh, are used to being oriented with that downward gravity vector. Now, when we remove that gravity vector and we move our heads around in 0G, the body has a different response. The brain interprets that lack of that orienting gravity vector um, as some sort of a problem, okay? And so you get uh, confusing cues. Your body gets a different visual cue than it, the inner ear gets, and you get different uh, uh, signals from the uh, joint sensors in your body in terms of body position. And this actually can often lead to what is known as space adaptation syndrome or space motion sickness. And essentially all motion sickness has the same root, and that is that the cues that your brain is getting from different parts of your body are in conflict with each other. And the brain subconsciously interprets this as you must have been poisoned by some sort of toxin, and you have to get rid of the toxin, and that's what triggers this vomit response. So if any of you have experienced any kind of motion sickness, whether that be car sickness or air sickness or sea sickness, it's the same sort of effect that the astronauts might often have in space for the first couple, two or three days uh, that they're there. Another thing that happens is a neuromuscular inhibition because again, we're so used to operating in a 1G gravity environment here on Earth that the removal of that G vector can cause us to be clumsy or uncoordinated in space while we're getting used to moving our arms and, and limbs around. Um, so that happens is one of the intermediate effects as well. And effects that occur within days to weeks of time in space um, include this blood pl plasma loss. So that is associated with the overall loss of bodily uh, fluid volume. And the, one of the most serious effects can, can be a loss of red blood cells. And that can actually lead to mild anemia system, uh, symptoms. And those can last actually after return to Earth as well. And cardiovascular uh, deconditioning occurs because uh, of the same effect. The heart doesn't have to pump blood up from your lower body against gravity. And so it's not having to work as hard to circulate blood in the body. Muscular atrophy also takes place because, again, you're not having to support your body weight. You're just floating around. Um, and so, again, you have all these various systems that are de getting deconditioned. So some of the longer-term effects that occur within weeks to months of your arrival in low gravity um, include progressive bone loss, which is uh, similar to what we see in elderly people who have osteoporosis. In fact, this symptom or this uh, effect has a name. It's called zero-gravity-induced osteoporosis. 
And so it's, like I said, it's very similar to what we see in elderly people, especially if they do not remain active, and uh, can lead to fragile bones and more susceptibility to breakage of bones and fractures. Um, and so this is, this is a serious problem as well. And as, basically, your, your bones are constantly remodeling themselves relative to the mechanical stresses that they experience. And um, so studies have been done on Earth of particularly an example of tennis players who are right-handed. And a comparison of the bone density in their right humerus, the bone in their upper, body, uh, upper arm, versus their left humerus to compare the, the density and the strength of the bones. And they've seen that the, uh, the bones in the dominant arm are much more dense and strong than those in the less used arm. And so this is another piece of evidence that your bones remodel themselves according to the amount of mechanical stress they experience. So what happens is uh, you have this constant process going on in your bones. And it involves one type of cell called osteoclasts tunnel through the bone like little Pac-Men. Remember the game Pac-Men? So they tunnel through the bone at a, a very small level. Um, and then they're followed by another type of cell called osteoblasts. And the osteoblasts lay down new bone. But this whole process is governed by the amount of mechanical stress or exercise that you do with your bones. And so because of the fact that you're just floating around in space rather than just walking around and doing your normal life in, in, on Earth, um, they remodel themselves much more weakly and less densely. And this is where the osteoporosis comes from. And in addition to that, because of the fact that they're essentially tearing down the bones, there's a lot of calcium and other minerals floating around in your system. And this can lead to kidney stones. So imagine, if you've ever known anyone who has had kidney stones, you know it's a very painful process. And so if you can imagine having kidney stones in space where you're not close to a hospital that can deal with them or even a, a bed at home where you can be comfortable, it would be an excruciating process, right? So another effect that is quite serious is the increased exposure to radiation in space where the International Space Station flies in what we call low Earth orbit, the astronauts on the space station are exposed to radiation at a dosing level that's 100 times that of what we experience here on the surface of the Earth. And we all know the adverse effects that can take place from increased radiation exposure. So uh, some of those effects include suppression. So that can, that can obviously be uh, a, an effect that can make you much more susceptible to um, other diseases. And then the effects of increased radiation exposure, as we all know, can lead to cell mutation, um, as well as certain forms of cancer developing and that sort of thing. So these are all very serious impacts for the astronauts. And so we try to figure out ways to make these physiological problems going away, go away. And um, it, the NASA researchers are primarily concerned about keeping the astronauts healthy during their time in space so that they don't have downtime and they can be productive while they're in space. It's very expensive to keep people in space and they need to be productive while they're there. And so in, instead of, uh, studying the health of the astronauts in a controlled fashion when they're in space, which would be very expensive to do and to control for other factors, essentially what they've done is they've kind of said, okay, well, we know these various countermeasures have some impact on keeping the astronauts healthy. And so we're going to basically try them all at once to get the best possible effect. And so the, the research, the basic research that happens is often in simulated conditions, which would be primarily bed rest studies, okay? So in bed rest studies, they have a, a group of volunteers who lie in bed and do not much of anything, and they measure what happens to their bones and their muscles and their cardiovascular conditioning over time. Now, it's not a perfect simulation because they're still exposed to gravity even though they're passive uh, within that gravity field. 
But on the space station, um, the researchers basically uh, have determined that an astronaut, in order to keep his or her physical conditioning at the level that it was when they left Earth, would have to exercise vigor vigorously four hours every day. Now, how many of you would be motivated to exercise four hours every day, even here at home on the Earth? <laughs> I don't see too many hands going up, <laughs> right? So imagine it being in space and having a very busy schedule of tasks and experiments and jobs that you have to do, plus sleep and eat and do everything else that a normal human does and trying to fit in four hours of exercise on top of all that, right? It's just not gonna happen, right? And so the astronauts typically manage only about one hour of exercise per day, right? And so that helps to some extent, but over time it catches up with them to the point where most astronauts, when they come back from months or even a year in space, are so physiologically deconditioned that when they arrive back on Earth, they have to be carried out of the space capsule because they can't stand or walk on their own power. And it takes quite some time for them to recover the level of fitness that they had when they left. So all of these problems are serious ones that have to be addressed in order to keep people healthy, safe, and productive in space. So after re-entry and post-landing, there is a recovery process that I just referred to. And so what happens in many instances is just the reverse of what happens when you go into space. So there's this fluid shift back from the upper body to the lower body. And remember, we've lost all of this blood volume as well as other bodily fluid volume while we we're in space. So the first thing, the first time they try to stand up, where does the blood go? Well, it doesn't go to their heads, it goes toward gravity, the direction of gravity downward to their feet, and that causes what we call orthostatic intolerance, and people faint. They fall over because of lack of blood to the brain. And this, again, I mentioned the, the loss of red blood cells, which can lead to uh, persistent anemia that uh, happens uh, even after they're back on Earth for a while. And there's a loss of coordination. Remember, we had to get used to moving around in zero gravity with the lack of gravity. And so the same thing happens when we come back to Earth. We have to get used to moving around in 1G now. And so there's this loss of coordination. We have to get used to it again. It's kind of like we're learning to walk all over again. Um, there, the muscle and bone atrophy has to be uh, addressed and that takes time. People have to be careful not to immediately go back to their normal fitness or workout or sports activities immediately after coming back to Earth because their bones are weaker and their muscles are weaker and their heart is weaker. And if they do that right away, that can lead to injury. And of course, the cardiovascular deconditioning has to be recovered from as well. So all of these things take time to recover from once you're back in a gravity field. And the same type of thing would actually apply in the trip to Mars, where once we land on Mars, there is gravity, but it's not as strong as Earth, so it's actually a slightly easier at adaptation from the time and space transiting between Earth and Mars. Uh, and once we're on the surface of Mars, then it's... A, like I say, it's not quite as drastic as coming back to Earth. Uh, Mars's gravity is three-eighths of the Earth's gravity. So uh, for comparison purposes, you would weigh just a little less than half of what you weigh on the Earth on Mars, right? So compared to the physiological problems of spaceflight, uh, there's been much less consideration to the psychological problems associated with spaceflight. Um, and there are various adjustments that have to take place. Um, but when we prepare, as we're looking forward to trips like going to Mars, where even a flyby mission to Mars would be about a year and a half, uh, and a landing mission to Mars would probably be about three years long. So, so far we've only had uh, people that have had experience of being in space for just a little over a year. So to go to Mars is quite a drastic step forward in terms of the amount of time in space. So as we start looking forward to these longer-term missions in space, 
we really have to pay more attention to some of these uh, psychological and social uh, requirements uh, that can impact not just an individual astronaut, but the entire crew. And some of the kinds of psychological effects uh, that people experience in spaceflight are common to any kind of remote expedition, even on the surface of planet Earth. And most of them relate in one way or another to two main issues, and those are isolation and confinement. So the idea of isolation is that you're away from your family and your friends and your culture that you're accustomed to, and you're confined in a small space with another small group of people. You know, it could be anywhere from one other person to perhaps five other people, and you better get along with them, because <laughs> you're going to be co cooped up with them for quite some time in most cases. So um, it's interesting to know that on submarine missions, which is another example of where people experience isolation and confinement, that uh, evacuations of the submarines for psychiatric disturbances ranks just behind evacuations for trauma and surgery. So it's a fairly common theme that people in these types of environments where they're isolated and confined can experience psychiatric issues. So there, and it's very hard also to plan for these or to know who might be susceptible to these sorts of breakdowns until you experience that sort of an environment. So these are, these are some tricky issues that we have to deal with as we plan for longer and longer duration spaceflight. As I mentioned before, the two main issues are isolation and confinement. And um, some of the ways that these things are um, prevented, or at least proposed to be prevented, are with uh, designing the vehicle or the habitat that the astronauts will be living in to um, represent the Earth as much as possible. And this, again, is a little bit of a, a double-edged sword, if you know what I mean. So uh, in one sense, uh, designing the, the vehicle so that it's more Earth-like might be more comfortable for people and might make people feel more at home, but um, it also has the downside of not taking advantage of the fact that you're floating around and you can work in any orientation that you desire. From a practicality standpoint, you can fit a lot more equipment into a space if you don't have to worry about where it's up and where it's down, right? So these can be at odds with each other. And there are various other things that have been discussed in terms of trying to prevent some of these psychological or sociological issues. Um, trying to determine, again, who's going to be susceptible to these things ahead of time uh, is, is not a perfect science by any means. Um, and so there probably have to be some access to counselors and psychotherapists while you're on board, whether that be with one of your crew members who, who is trained in that area or communications with Earth which gets more and more problematic with the time lag the farther that you get away from, from Earth and closer to Mars. So, Some of the other things that are, are important in spaceflight are personal hygiene. Um, if you can imagine being cooped up with a group of five other people who don't shower on a regular basis, that can prove to be rather offensive and bothersome after a period of time. <laughs> and so, Personal hygiene and health is really important, and to be able to provide ways for people to stay clean as well as healthy and groomed um, might sound trivial, but it actually turns out to be pretty important over the long haul. So uh, clothing is another thing that uh, gets considerable attention for spaceflight. And if you live in a, with a group of people, you know that uh, people's favorite temperature isn't always the same, right? Uh, if you're cold, somebody else might be hot and vice versa. And so the clothing options are designed to be layered so that people who run cold can put a little more clothing on. Uh, people who run, off, run hot can take some clothing off. So, and the other thing uh, that's kind of interesting with the clothing as well as the design of the overall environment is we make great use of Velcro. You know what Velcro is, right? 
um, because, because of the fact that not only people float, things float, right? And so you, being able to ha stick something onto your pant leg or onto your shirt sleeve or something like that, or even a wall, just to know where it is, know that it is where you left it, rather than have to chase around the vehicle to try to figure out where you put that pad of paper. So um, we always talk about in the spacesuit design world, the spacesuit design world, the spacecraft design world, uh, and the mission planning world of spaceflight, that crew safety must always be the top priority. Over everything else, we have to make the crew safe. And one of the most important things is to prevent uh, people from coming in contact with hazards that can be life-threatening. So imagine yourself working in a pressure suit, working in a space suit outside the vehicle. Essentially, while you're working in a space suit, you're in your own little spacecraft. It's a miniature spacecraft with its own life support system. It's got an air revitalization system in it with oxygen supplied to it. It has underneath the outer garment, which is a pressurized system that holds atmospheric pressure, you have what is called a liquid cooled and ventilated garment that has uh, liquid tubes circulating uh, water through it to cool you down as you work. Um, and as again, I said, it is a, its own little spacecraft, right? And so it's ex essential that we protect people working in the spacesuit or even inside the vehicle from sharp edges and corners that they could snag the suit on or even puncture their flesh with. Um, so it's, when, when it comes to the point of, of uh, protecting from those hazards, uh, the alternative can be quite uh, severe. If you were to puncture the spacesuit, you would lose the pressure and die within a very short period of time. And it's not a pretty picture to think about what happens to the human body when it's exposed to vacuum. Uh, some of the, the recent sci-fi movies don't do a very good job of portraying exactly what would happen, but trust me, it's not pretty. <laughs> um, okay, and it's also very important uh, that uh, the mission planners map out realistic task timelines and give the astronauts adequate time to get things done. It may be a task that they can do very quickly on the Earth, but in space, there, everything takes longer than you think it's going to take. Um, and so it has to be mapped out realistically and adequate time allowed for various procedures. And we always, do you know the, the saying Murphy's Law? Okay, so if anything can go wrong, it will go wrong, right? This is very true in spaceflight, and so we have to always have a backup plan for every procedure. If it doesn't work right the first time, you have to have a backup plan for how to get it accomplished. And in some cases, that can be a life-threatening thing if you don't have a backup plan. And so all of these things come back to the crew safety has to be the first priority. So the last thing I want to talk about today is a project that we've been doing at California Baptist University in Southern California, um, which is a high-altitude balloon project. And we launched our first high-altitude balloon with um, the aerospace students group. It's um, actually part of a, of a global uh, group called Students for Exploration and Development of Space. Uh, you may have heard of it, it's called, the short name for it is SEDS, S-E-D-S. And uh, we have a group at, at California Baptist that um, is working on these high altitude balloon projects. We had our first launch last spring. We, uh, you see in this picture, although the, the lighting is not great, um, making pre-launch pre preparations um, before dawn out in the desert, uh, not too far from our campus, about an hour, hour and a half drive or so. And um, we're getting our payload ready to attach to the balloon. The payload uh, included a GoPro camera, a GPS tracking device, and some hand warmers to keep the equipment warm while it went up to high altitudes. And this, these photographs show uh, filling the balloon with helium just as the sun's coming up and we're getting ready for launch. And then after, so basically the, the uh, payload and the balloon rose to about 80,000 feet. 
and um, then it bursts because of the pressure differential between the atmospheric pressure and the pressure inside the balloon. And the payload returns to Earth with a parachute. And again, we had the GPS tracking device on it, so after about an hour and a half, we drove about 20 miles out in the desert to find the uh, payload where it landed. And you can see our group trekking across the desert to find the landing site. And the picture in the lower right shows us with the payload that we recovered. And this is one of our photos from high altitude, 80,000 feet, looking back to the Earth. And I don't know if you can see, but you can actually, if you look very closely, see the thin blue line of the Earth's atmosphere that you see from space. So we're very proud of this uh, project. And uh, our students are now working on the next version, which will uh, include a communication package that will allow us to transmit data from the payload to the ground in real time. So we're really excited about this and, and feel that this um, concept actually has a lot of um, applications for different uh, projects around the world in different industries. So with that, I'd like to thank you for your time. And I think we can open the floor to questions. So thanks again. I just had a picture taken from a balloon project. Blue line on the Earth's surface is visible. What does it indicate? It's the blue line is the Earth's atmosphere as seen from that altitude. So it's, you're looking edge on to the Earth's atmosphere. So you can actually see that, that thin blue line represents the, uh, the Earth's atmosphere as it goes from very dense near the surface of the Earth to less dense in space. So we're high enough to see that, which is kind of cool. So um, uh, I just wanted to know, um, you talked about a lot of conditions that happen in space to people, the physiological conditions and the psychological conditions. I wanted to know what happens to time when you're in space. Hmm. Because we've had a lot of uh, Doctor Who series and we've had a lot of Interstellar telling us what happens, but we want to know <laughs> real time what happens to time and how it flicks. Yeah, it's, it's a very, very slight effect at the speeds that we're traveling at. Um, our, our technology so far for spaceflight is, doesn't allow us to even travel at 1 one hundredth of the speed of light. And so it's a very, very slight effect. There have been spacecraft that have been designed to test that effect. Uh, one in particular called Gravity Probe B that was uh, designed to test Einstein's theory of relativity. And uh, it's a very, very slight effect at the speeds that we're traveling at because we're not even close to the speed of light. That effect gets more and more strong the closer you get to the speed of light. But we're just, we don't have the technology yet. So good question, though. Uh, yeah. Good morning. Uh, I wanted to know that uh, I, I saw all the slides and I just realized that it's not very easy. It's quite difficult and it's a very hectic, tiresome process on the part of the scientists to go on a space mission. So I wanted to know what motivates them on such a level to uh, put their body, uh, you know, on... Yes, that's a good, great, great question. So where's the motivation come from? And this is something that I, I discuss with my students a lot, okay? So everyone is different. And um, so what I talk about with my students is the idea that we all have things that we absolutely love to do, right? things that we're passionate about, and we would do whether we get paid for it or not, right? And then we also have things that we are very good at, right? And so if you remember from grade school math, you learned about Venn diagrams, right? Overlapping circles of sets of things. So you take those two circles, the things that we're very passionate about and love to do, the things that we're very good at, and we look at the overlap of those two circles. There's a small area in the middle where they overlap. So the things that we love to do, we're also very good at. We all have things that we love that we're not very good at, or things that we're good at that we hate to do, right? But we want to find that sweet spot where they overlap. And that's, to me, where people should be pursuing their career, is in that sweet spot. Because number one, with your passions, you will be internally motivated to pursue them. 
But number two, with the things that you're good at, you will be ex externally motivated because people will see that in you and they will see that you're good at it and they will encourage you to continue. So again, I call it the sweet spot that we're looking for. And that gives you both internal motivation as well as external motivation. Does that make sense? Good question. Thanks. Uh, you just mentioned about the special theory of relative of Einstein. So uh, as we go to Einstein about time dilution on mass effect, so if we are uh, possible to reach about 0.1% of speed of light, will these effects of time dilution and mass effect will occur on us? I'm sorry, can you say it again? I, you're ta can you talk a little slower? Uh, actually, I was saying that uh, as according to Einstein, right. about time dilution and mass effect. Yes. So if it's possible that we reach the speed of light of only 0.1%, so if the effects will affect on us, what time dilution and mass effect? Okay, so you're basically asking about the effect. If we were able to travel at the speed of light, uh, what would be the result in terms of effect on our bodies, right? So, so yeah, in our... Huh, well, we don't know. The easy answer is we don't know because we haven't experienced it yet. But theoretically, yeah, time... Uh, time uh, essentially slows down the closer that we get to the speed of light, right? So the aging process would slow down um, relative to the way that time is passing back on Earth. If we're able to travel close to the speed of light, then time for us slows down. Okay. So as he said about the frame of reference, yes. I I was trying. so if uh, the speed will differ, so will the time will differ about, about making continuous loops and all? I, I'm sorry, can you say it again? I, I'm just having a hard time un understanding. Uh, actually, I'm talking about if, uh, according to Einstein, about time dilution. Right. What he meant was that if we reach the speed of light, yes. it will make a difference in the time dimensions and all. So will it affect as if we reach the speed of light? I'm, I'm still not quite sure I'm getting the question. I mean, I understand what you're saying as far as um, Einstein's theory, um, but I, I'm not sure what your question is. I'm so sorry. Actually, right, uh, talking about the time traveling over there. Yeah. As he mentioned in his theory that yes. if it's possible that we reach the speed of light, yes. we can time travel. Yes. So will it happen if we, we go over there in the speed of light? What will happen if we go to the speed of light? Yeah. Yeah, so again, we're not quite sure. I mean, the, the theory basically says that that time will, will slow down and and not pass as quickly for us um, but, and we won't age the same way, but, but the thing is, it's, it's hard for us to know because at this point in time, all we can observe are, uh, particles of light or photons. So theoretically, uh, if we were able to travel at the speed of light, then time would basically stop. But, um, you know, it's hard to imagine if time stops, what happens to our physiological processes, right? I mean, does our heart keep beating, right? I mean, these are all questions that we don't really know the answer to. Um, so Einstein's theory is very, very interesting, um, but we're, we're very far away from being able to um, achieve those velocities in space right now. So I mean, like I say, our technology at this stage of time doesn't even allow us to travel at one one hundredth of the speed of light. So we're, we, we need, in, in order to uh, explore the far reaches of just even our galaxy, let alone the universe, we need some sort of a, a technological breakthrough or a paradigm shift uh, away from chemical propulsion to something much different. Um, you know, people have talked about travel through wormholes, which uh, because of the, the gravitational forces that your body would experience would probably result in death. So wormhole travel is probably not the answer. But you know, some of the other things that people are speculating about now are things like um, quantum entanglement, uh, teleportation ideas. But these are all, at this point in time, they're science fiction, not science fact. So we're a long way from being able to uh, experiment in a meaningful way in terms of what it would mean for a, a biological uh, entity to travel at those speeds. Again, like I say, theoretically, according to Einstein, 
uh, time would essentially slow to a stop, but again, how do you survive that as an organism? If, if time truly stops, then does that mean that your physiological system ceases functioning? Right, so the, these, are, these are the questions that we don't know answers to yet. Great, great ones to think about. It's, it's fun to do these, what I call thought experiments, right? To think about these things, but we really don't have the answers. Great question, though. I like, I like the way you're thinking. Thank you. I wanted to ask, why are there no manned missions to moon now? We have had a couple of science fiction documentaries, a couple of controversies around it, but why are we not having manned missions to moon or to, while we already have the technology to? You, you just read my mind. <laughs> I am a strong advocate for going back to the moon and is establishing a long-term human presence on the moon because if we have these problems that I've been talking about in long-duration spaceflight, it's very easy to evacuate a crew from the moon back to Earth. It's just a matter of days to get a crew, crew person back to Earth from the moon. Whereas if we have an emergency, on Mars at any random time, it can take as much as a year and a half to get them back to Earth. And that's not much in terms of an emergency response, right? That's pretty poor. And so it's my feeling that we need to go back to the moon and establish a base, do our homework, so to speak, do research more on these problems of long duration spaceflight before we somewhat recklessly send people to Mars to live for a long duration. Now a short term duration mission to Mars might be a reasonable thing to do in the near term. But even a, a, a flyby mission where you just leave Earth, fly by Mars and wave as you're going by and come back to Earth without landing, that's a year and a half, okay? Um, the longest experience we've had on space station is, with human spaceflight is just over a year. So that's still really pushing the envelope for what we know, right? But if you go to Mars and land on the surface and then come back, the shortest duration mission proposed for that is three years. So that's three times as long as we've ever had anybody in space. So it's a little scary to do that, but I, I could see doing that uh, before doing a longer duration uh, presence on the surface of Mars because like I say, I think it's a little bit reckless for us to do that when we couldn't get people back from Mars quickly. So I really believe in going back to the moon and establishing really a, a, a test case, if you will, uh, a test bed to do more of this research on keeping people healthy and safe in space for long durations. So bravo, good idea. <laughs> so I was just wondering uh, and keeping this question of uh, uh, discussion of uh, science fiction and science realities, so I was just wondering there was one case in uh, the interstellar movie mm -hmm. where the pod was revolving at some speeds to mm -hmm. produce uh, gravitational fields of equivalent to 1G. Uh, are there experiments being going on in this field or? Uh? Yeah, there are, um, but primarily with uh, animals, small animals. In fact, the space station has a small uh, uh, centrifuge for animals aboard it. So, so there are various studies that are taking place with, with small animals on uh, bone loss in space and the effect of centrifugation uh, also cardiovascular deconditioning and that sort of thing on animals, in addition to the bed rest studies that I mentioned earlier. Um, and I also am a strong advocate for uh, developing a system to use artificial gravity uh, en route to Mars. Uh, now the reason that we really haven't done anything with human-sized centrifuges in space is because of the fact that we, it would be extremely expensive to build a very large structure that would be adequate to use to centrifuge stu uh, actual people. Um, so if you imagine um, even a, a small human centrifuge that would be, let's, let's just say, twice the height of the average human, okay? You spin that up to the point where they have 1G at their feet, their head is still gonna be experiencing 0G, 
And so what happens to all the blood? It all, it's going to rush to your feet, and you're going to pass out, and it's going to be worthless. So, uh, so in order to build a centrifuge that's large enough so that you don't have what I just described as a gravity gradient effect across the human body, it has to be very large. Uh, the old movie, I don't know if any of you have seen it, 2001, A Space Odyssey, shows a very large wheel in space that's a centrifuge, and that's on the scale that it would have to be for a human centrifuge. But another idea that has been proposed, and it, I think it's a very good one, is the idea of having a space vehicle, a habitat, uh, small, small, ish um, habitat for humans, uh, and then a tether, a cable that would pay out from that habitat and a countermass. And then you just rotate the entire thing about its center of mass and achieve centrifugation that way with a relatively small uh, spacecraft. Uh, and it would be much less expensive than building the full structure. So I think, though, for going to Mars, that, that that's a very uh, important task. Good question. Thank you. At some point of time, you all want to become astronaut <laughs> and get a small. But as we grow up, we just uh, got to know how the gravity of the subject. Like, th we have these proverbs, uh, proverbs also that whenever we are doing something difficult, people used to say that, this is not rocket science, you can do it. <laughs> so <laughs> these uh, proverbs also, you know, show the gravity of the subject. So you opted for political science, and then you uh, change your subject to aero, uh, aero engineering. Mm -hmm. So what is the inspiration or what is the motivation? And when you realize that you are good at it, and that's why you are opting it. Okay, so yeah, so what I talked about before in terms of the Venn diagram with passions and things you're good at, for me that was very much uh, about, you know, students would ask me, you know, how did you pick your career path? How did you choose to do what you do? And I had to think about it. And it was very much uh, the process that I went through was as a child, as you saw in the video, my father had a telescope and we would look at the stars and the moon and the planets. And that inspired my early wonder at space. And you know, are there other worlds out there to explore? And it really motivated me to get involved in that area. And then as I got into college, I started thinking, well, you know, the things that I really enjoy are things related to science, and particularly astronomy and space. And, and yet I also really like being active and being kind of an adventurer, an explorer. And so I started thinking, what kind of a career would co combine those uh, interests with things that I'm also good at? And I was getting good grades in science and astronomy and space-related things, and I was also getting uh, you know, rewards from people uh, that saw me perform and uh, encouraged me in those things. So I had both the internal motivation as well as the external mo motivation. And in some ways, I feel like you know, our university, Cal Baptist University, um, has a, a motto, live your purpose. And for me, it really rings true. It makes it, I feel like this is what I was born to do. This is my purpose or my calling in life, or at least part of it, uh, is to be an explorer in, in the realm of science and space. Good question, thank you. Ma'am, uh, my question is, what were the different turning points in your life? Hmm. Wow, <laughs> what are the different? So one of them certainly was looking at the the heavens with my uh, my father and his telescope. So that was that was a turning point. Um, I had another very personal turning point uh, when I went to a camp uh, when I was nine years old. Uh, I was very young, and I went to a camp where I felt like I had a spiritual experience, and I felt like um, I felt like I very much was being told what my purpose was in life uh, and that I was called to um, listen to what God would ask me to do in life. And that, that resulted in a life that was very sensitive to the spiritual side of things and my faith has become very important. And so I've, I've been very willing to, uh, instead of just kind of pursuing whatever I want to do, uh, be very sensitive to the opportunities that come my way 
that are not ones that happen easily. Okay, so kind of opportunities that are, feel very special. They have a very special calling. And you probably have all experienced this at one time or another where you had a really unique opportunity to do something. And so for me, it was about trusting that and saying, I'm not going to be afraid to walk through that door into that opportunity. And so that happened again. That was at a very young age. I was nine years old. And so from then on, I tried to be sensitive to those opportunities. And, uh, and then in college, um, I chose, as one of you noted, to major in political science. But um, I was also taking a lot of math and science at the, at the same time because I'd always been told that I was good at that. And so um, I did uh, my senior year in college, my final year in college, I did an internship program with the US government at the Department of State. And I was very interested in international relations, but I, I saw in the State Department uh, that there were not a lot of people who had technical expertise. And that kind of drew me back into grad school in technical fields. That was a turning point for me also. And when I was in grad school studying aerospace and engineering, I got interested again in how I could best pursue a career in space science. And so that was a turning point for me as well. And so I've had, I've had a variety of those through my life. And you know I've done different things because of it. And um, I think you saw in the video that I also worked on the Bellagio Fountains in Las Vegas. That was another turning point. Uh, and actually, it, it involved a move for me. I was, I was situated in uh, the northern part of California State. And uh, I had to move to Southern California in order to do that. And that uh, led to some more networking opportunities and teaching opportunities and a variety of things. Um, so again, it's, for me, it's always been about looking for those really special, unique opportunities and being willing to walk through those doors without being afraid. Does that make sense? Great question. Thank you. Uh, during your introduction, Professor Divakar mentioned that uh, you are also, you were, or I'm not sure, uh, do you still play volleyball? Oh, yes. Okay, that's <laughs> great. So, uh, I just wanted to ask you that, uh, how has your experience uh, uh, in playing sports uh, affected your, uh, in a good sense or in a bad sense, mm -hmm. in your professional life? How, how are these two connected? Experience in sports and experience in professional Okay, life. Good, good question. I don't get asked that very often, but I like it. <laughs> Um, yeah, that's, that's really a great question. And so I think my experience in sports has done a couple of very important things for me. One is it has increased my confidence in my abilities to do things that I take, take on. Um, and, and, and I've been involved in sports since I was quite young. And just being able to accomplish things physically, uh, I think, instills a great level of confidence in young people. And so that's one thing. Um, and also, actually there's three now that I've, I'm thinking of it. <laughs> so so uh, individual confidence. Uh, secondly is teamwork in working together with people because in industry, almost any profession you go into, teamwork is really important, right? You have to be able to get along with people and work together as a team. And then, um, the third thing, which is escaping me now, I had three. <laughs> so uh, like I say, individual confidence, uh, teamwork, and what was the third thing? <laughs> now I'm blanking on it, so I'll have, maybe come back to it, I'm sorry. But that's a really good question, so. Um, yeah, wow. <laughs> oh, I guess just the fitness, uh, you know, the fitness involved with being involved in sport is very important for the space industry, right? And, and especially if you're going to be an astronaut, it's, it's important to have the discipline and the diligence to exercise regularly and maintain that fitness because, as I said, in spaceflight, you really have to uh, be very disciplined and diligent about your exercise routine in order to preserve basic bodily functions, you know, cardiovascular, muscle, and bone. So there might have been something else, but anyway, those are three. <laughs> Do 
did you face any difficulties <laughs> being a woman in this field like if anybody demotivated you how did you overcome that hmm that was a very good question yeah i mean even in the us uh, there are still many areas of of industry um, uh, that are male dominated and um, and this area of aerospace engineering is still that way. Um, and especially certain sectors of it are, are still very um, male dominated. And so, yeah, I mean, I think every woman in a male dominated industry probably experiences some form of, of harassment um, at some level. Uh, it can be of all different kinds, but um, fortunately, in addition to people who uh, were not supportive of women working in the aerospace industry, I was surrounded by a lot of people who were, and who were very interested in helping to uh, recognize my skills and talents and promote me to enable the accomplishment of certain goals and dreams. So. So yeah, I mean, it's, it's really like any area of life, you know, you, you focus on the, the positive and the people that are going to be supportive and, you know, I mean, there's, there, we have a saying in the United States, maybe it's the same here, but, um, you know, if people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. And the other saying that goes right along with that is people don't remember what you say but they remember how they make you feel, right? And so this is something that I think is, it applies to life in general. You know, you, you gravitate toward people who are gonna be supportive and positive and away from people who are negative and drag you down. Um, otherwise, you'd stay in bed all day <laughs> and get out of bed, right? So um, I think it's important and, and it's also because of the fact that we can only control our own behaviors and our own words, it's important for us to be positive people and encouraging people that others want to be around, right? And that we can support other people's goals and dreams as well. Great question, thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Wickman. Um, this was fabulous. And uh, before we uh, come to the end of it, um, I would want to thank uh, California Baptist University. Brian is here. We have uh, two people and representing us, Ashish Sarkar and Kanisha from Edlinks as well. Uh, just, just for information, uh, California Baptist University and Jagan Lake City University has a strong uh, MOU and tie-up. Uh, particularly, we started with the management school, and I think uh, we have been discussing about how we can expand this partnership across different schools, even engineering as well. So I think uh, it was fantastic, and uh, Dr. Wickman, uh, you know, living and working in space gives us such a big picture, actually, if you look at it. And I think uh, you are phenomenal from that aspect. Uh, so thank you for that. Uh, before we conclude, uh, I would request uh, Dr. Vivek Kharia, Dean, to please come over and honor Dr. Wickman. I request uh, Dr. Nilesh Khare to please come forward and uh, honor Brian. Brian has been absolutely supportive of this partnership and has been along with Edlinks instrumental in getting uh, Dr. Ekman here. Can I request you to join us? Oh, no, please yeah, go please, ahead. Please, I'll, I'll come. I'll come. The come. office is done a lot, right? So, please. I would also uh, 
take this opportunity to uh, welcome a lifestyle journalism professor from London College of Communication, Dr. Lucia Vodanimik, uh, who is here for a week and uh, she'll be delivering lectures to our journalism students. So thank you so much for being here and uh, hopefully tomorrow we'll have some good sessions with the journalism students. Yes. <laughs> and thank you so much for all of you. And I, I think uh, we're very proud of the way that you know our students ask questions to some of those speakers who come in here. As you all know, this uh, JLU Knowledge Series is, is something that the university has started. It is a marquee knowledge series. We'll be doing it um, you know, on a, on a two-monthly basis or three-monthly basis, depending on what kind of a speaker we get. We'll be getting speakers from different disciplines that our university works on. So today you had Dr. Wickman, who is a nautical engineer and uh, science and technology. Last time we had somebody from a management background and from marketing. Hopefully in future we'll have more and uh, look forward to all of you having back in this particular studios. I must definitely thank our uh, media production uh, team. They work very hard. We, you, as you all know, this particular studio just came up in October. The few uh, technical stuff that we are still trying to fix it, but I think they do a phenomenal job in setting it up, along with the JLU Knowledge Series team and, and these students who work very hard to get these um, you know, video shoots and audios and everything in place. So thank you so much to all of you. <laughs>